Hello everyone, I am Shreya Paul and I am a third year medical student from West Bengal. So the topic that I am going to discuss today is coagulation. So this is the topic that I wasn't very comfortable in my first year but now I am. So I thought that maybe there might be many students who are actually facing problem with this topic. So maybe I could help some of you. So here begins the topic. So see in order to study coagulation what we first need to know that why coagulation actually occurs right. So all this starts with the phenomena of blood vessel injury or what we call as vascular injury. So when there is a vascular injury or blood vessel injury what happens suppose there is a tear in the blood vessel or there is some injury to the blood vessel and there is blood loss because whenever the blood vessel is injured the blood vessel will tear up or there will be some kind of rupture so what happens there is blood loss now when there is blood loss the blood is continuously going to decrease and our blood volume will decrease so what we need at that time is a body's mechanism to decrease the blood loss so what does our body have in order to decrease our blood loss there are two mechanisms in our body which will decrease our blood loss one is the vasoconstriction and the other is the clotting now how does this exactly play their role? Suppose there is a blood vessel where injury has occurred. So this is an injured blood vessel say. So when the injury has occurred, the cells which first reach the site of injury are the platelets. Suppose these are the platelets that reach the injured site. So these platelets will then release what is called as serotonin. Now this serotonin causes vasoconstriction. And when there is vasoconstriction, we know that the blood loss will be decreased, right? So what happens? This is an immediate mechanism that happens as soon as there is a vascular injury. So when there is a blood vessel injury or a vascular injury, immediately what happens? The platelets come to the site and the platelets release serotonin and this serotonin causes vasoconstriction and this decreases the blood loss. So this is how this goes. But here what we are seeing due to vasoconstriction the blood loss is decreased but it is not stopped okay so this is basically a temporary phenomena which occurs immediately after injury but what is the permanent solution that will stop the blood loss so that is what is called clotting okay now for clotting we what is clotting clotting is basically coagulation all right clotting occurs because of coagulation so for clotting what we need are the clotting factors and this is the discussion topic today that is coagulation so now we will deal with what is coagulation or what is clotting so does this clot formation occurs which actually stops the blood loss and this clot formation requires clotting factors and this clotting factors let me tell you that they are always present in our body but they are in inactivated form this clotting factors they are activated only when there is injury so clotting factors change from inactivated clotting factors to activated clotting factors when injury occurs right now what are the clotting factors that we are talking about there are many clotting factors and it was a great deal for me to in order to memorize this clotting factors so there is a mnemonic that i follow in order to remember them so if you have some other mnemonic you can follow that or else you can use this one see don't go by the meaning of this statement but uh, it actually helps in remembering okay so the mnemonic goes for pt take calcium and protein powder abc stupid counselings have finished okay there is no meaning as such but then it helps in remembering okay see F, uh, the first letter of each word actually gives the first letter of each clotting factor right see f for we get fibrinogen which is clotting factor 1 p for we get prothrombin which is clotting factor 2 t for we get tissue thromboplastin which is clotting factor 3 for C, we get calcium, which is the clotting factor 4. For P, here we get proacylerin, which is the clotting factor 5. Again, for P, here we get proconvertin, which is the clotting factor 7. And here, A, B, C. Here, A stands for anti-hemophilic factor A. The A here denotes the A here. B here stands for clotting factor 9 that is anti-hemophilic factor B. So uh, let me tell you that anti-hemophilic factor B is also known as the Christmas factor. So this C stands for the Christmas factor. So both B and C here stands for clotting factor 9. Okay. So the S here stands for the clotting factor 10 that is the Stuart factor. And the C here stands for clotting factor 11 that is anti-hemophilic factor C. 
okay so the h here have h of half stands for clotting factor 12 that is hegman factor and f of finished stands for clotting factor 13 that is fibrin stabilizing factor so this is the easy way which i found in order to remember the clotting factors it uh, is very important actually to know all the clotting factors because we need it again and again okay so these are the clotting factors that are required in coagulation now what does clotting factors do there is a series of pathway that these clotting factors undergo in order to fuel up the process of coagulation so let's see what are the actual pathways that take place in coagulation or clotting now when i talk about coagulation pathway it it is a huge term all right and sometimes this term brings a great confusion in our minds but truly speaking coagulation pathway is nothing but it is actually clot formation so never get confused with this term coagulation means clot formation right so what are the coagulation pathways that we have in our body there are actually three kinds of coagulation pathway intrinsic pathway extrinsic pathway and the third is a common pathway the extrinsic pathway is also known as tissue factor pathway okay now what actually happens first when clotting starts the first pathway to work is the intrinsic pathway fine this intrinsic pathway is then followed on by the extrinsic pathway after the intrinsic pathway has worked the extrinsic pathway came, comes into the play and after that both these pathways finally merge into a common pathway so this is what actually happens now what are the mechanisms that take place in this pathways let's see that now talking about what actually happens in this pathways by now we all know that there are three pathways intrinsic extrinsic and the common pathway and we all also know that the clotting factors are involved in this pathway now how exactly are the clotting factors related in this pathways okay so first we see the intrinsic pathway here we can see that the clotting factor 12 is the first factor which comes into play this clotting factor 12 gets converted to active factor 12a with the help of two things one is the high molecular weight kininogen and the second thing is the calcrein so this 12 converts to 12a now this factor 12a helps in conversion of factor 11 to 11a now these are all the active forms okay the a form written is the active form of the clotting factor because i have told you that clotting factors are always there but they stay in inactivated form so here we can see by adding a i mean the factors are activated so here 12 is converted to 12a and subsequently 12a converts clotting factor 11 to 11a and this clotting factor 11a converts factor 9 to 9a and this 9a then converts factor 8 to 8a so we can see that this is all about the intrinsic pathway so what are the factors that are involved in the intrinsic pathway it is the clotting factor 12 factor 11 factor 9 and factor 8 thus intrinsic pathway is over now coming to the extrinsic pathway the important factor involved in the extrinsic pathway is factor 3 that is tissue thromboplastin right so this factor 3 what it does is that is that it converts factor 7 to active factor 7a so this is the conversion that takes place in the extrinsic pathway now what happens i have told you that both the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway they ultimately converge in in order to enter to the common pathway now what happens in the common pathway is that factor 10 gets converted to 10a okay so here we can see that factor 10 gets converted to 10a and this factor 10a converts factor 5 to 5a so ultimately what we are having in the common pathway we are having a 10a and 5a so here we are seeing that we are having a 10a and 5a what happens after this is that this 10a and 5a with the help of calcium what it does that it converts prothrombin to thrombin so what we are seeing is that in common pathway after 10a and 5a are formed what it does it carries on a, carries out an important conversion that is conversion of prothrombin to thrombin so how this conversion takes place prothrombin in the presence of factor 10a 5a and calcium gets converted to thrombin now what is this thrombin what this thrombin does is that thrombin converts the fibrinogen to fibrin 
Now, this is a very important step because thrombin here converts fibrinogen to fibrin. So, fibrin is formed in the presence of thrombin, right? This fibrin then in the presence of factor 13 gets converted to the definitive clot. What is factor 13? Factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor. So, what we are seeing that the fibrin which is formed is actually stabilized by the fibrin stabilizing factor and thus it forms the definitive clot that is the clot we are talking about. Now, what what is it that makes the clot strong because the clot has to be strong in order to prevent the blood loss right so what happens is that this factor 13 that is the fibrin stabilizing factor what is what it does is that it stabilizes the fibrin molecules it stabilizes the fibrin molecules and it makes the clot stronger and thus the definitive clot or the clot that is formed is actually very strong so this is all that happens in the entire pathway of coagulation and uh, this is how our clot is formed so in short what we saw is that it all begins with a vascular injury or a blood vessel injury so when a vas vessel or a blood vessel is injured what happens is that there is blood loss and our body has its mechanism to decrease the blood loss which are two in number so one mechanism of decreasing in blood loss is vasoconstriction and the other is clot formation now what vasoconstriction does it is a temporary phenomena and what how this vasoconstriction happens when there is an injury the platelets come to the site of injury this platelets release serotonin and cause vasoconstriction and ultimately cause decrease in blood loss but since this is a temporary phenomena our body requires a permanent phenomena which can actually stop the blood loss and that occurs by clot the mechanism of clotting and this clotting actually takes place by the coagulation pathway now what is the coagulation pathway it has three pathways intrinsic extrinsic and the common pathway it involves the clotting factors which I have already discussed and what are the things that happen in this pathways are already said so this is what actually happens and ultimately through all these pathways our clot is formed so this this concept was unclear to me for the longest time but now since it is clear i thought of sharing with you people hope this helped you if it did actually help you let me know in the comments down below and uh, you can also comment down some other topics that you would like to hear from me thank you